Welcome to the Museum of Natural and Cultural History. My name is Lauren Willis. I work here in the Education and the Exhibits Department. Um, thank you all so much for coming out today. And I think it's starting to drizzle a little bit, so braving the rain. Um, so we are 10 days away from the 38th anniversary of the eruption of Mount St. Helens. The eruption was the largest and most destructive volcanic eruption recorded in U.S. history. So today we're pleased to welcome Dr. Brandon Schmant to talk about his role on an interdisciplinary project to investigate the architecture of the Greater Mount St. Helens Magmatic System. Dr. Schmant earned his PhD from the U of O in 2011 and is currently an assistant professor in the Earth and Planetary Science Department at the University of New Mexico. His research interests focus on resolving Earth's seismic properties to gain insight into tectonic and magmatic processes. His talk today is sponsored by the Geodynamic Processes at Rifting and Subducting Margins, also known as Geoprisms, um, their science program as part of their Distinguished Lectureship Program. So please join me in welcoming him. come back and visit, visit University of Oregon again. I haven't really been back here since um, I graduated, so exciting to see it. And one of the things that's exciting and linked to this talk is that um, it's, a, it's a earth science department that is really um, growing and thriving and a strong place for volcanology research. So um, while I'm visiting, talking about Cascades volcanoes and Mount St. Helens, um, you have a bunch of uh, great experts and um, rising young scientists here, so um, it's a cool place to uh, keep an eye on if you're interested in volcanoes. Um, this program mentioned uh, geoprisms. I should just say that um, it is a National Science Foundation program. Um, funds fundamental science looking at um, plate margins, um, at rifting margins, and at subduction zone margins. And what's distinctive about it, rather than say, um, maybe my specialty, geophysics or, or geochemistry or other programs, is that they identify focus sites where um, scientists from different perspectives, chemical, physical, field mapping, um, all sort of play together. They all focus on the same spot and say we're going to try and understand this from a variety of different directions. And so that's what's um, special about geoprisms. And so I'll mention some different types of research going on along the way, but I'm a seismologist and we'll uh, mostly focus there. Um, so what I'll, I'll talk about, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time sort of ramping up and um, talk about uh, Mount St. Helens sort of in uh, a perspective of global volcanic activity and also um, geologic time and that geologists are all a bit weird in that we casually mention things like a million years ago. Um, and, and then once we have that context, kind of talk about what this new project is that I'm involved with and sort of why that's, that's going on and what, what our aims are. And then uh, get to the meat of, of some of the, the new things that, that we're learning. Um, so, where are volcanoes located globally? What makes eruptions explosive or hazardous? And how often do big eruptions occur? Are kind of good things to have in our minds before we um, dig into to St. Helens a bit more. Um, so globally, if we're to look at um, volcanoes, um, if you're interested enough to, to show up, any of you are probably familiar with terms like sort of the ring of fire around the Pacific. Um, but what this map shows are, are two things, the black triangles, um, Holocene or last 10,000 year um, eruptions um, from, from major volcanoes, um, not a complete data set, but many of them. And then also earthquakes. And the earthquakes do a nice job of showing you the fact that, that Earth's surface is made out of distinct plates, and that, that's really where most of the action is geologically. Um, if we're to look at the right, this is kind of a funny map, um, but this is one where satellites detect deformation on Earth, that is to say, you made the earth out of little tiles, um, and you were asked if any of those tiles are changing their size and shape. Um, though areas that have bright colors would be where, with a decade of satellite data, we could measure, show measurable um, deformation. And so we can again see that it highlights these narrow plate boundaries like the ocean ridges, 
shows broader zones of deformation at subduction zone boundaries, like say the Andes subduction zone. And then it shows that the western US is kind of an unusual area and that it has a very broad plate boundary region. Um, and and that's, that's where we'll be focused. Um, so volcanoes are located at all those places, but there are a variety of different styles of volcanic activity. And um, if we were to go on to the next question, how often do big eruptions occur? Um, it depends what you mean by big. Um, so we need to have some scale. When we talk about earthquakes, we might talk about a magnitude. You would hear something like a Richter magnitude, or perhaps uh, more accurately, a moment magnitude scale. We use a volcanic explosivity index to sort of uh, quantify um, the severity of volcanic eruptions. And so we'll, we'll try and introduce that scale. For reference, Mount St. Helens in 1980, um, the eruption whose anniversary we're coming up on, um, that was right at the very lowest end of a BEI, Volcanic Explosivity Index 5 eruption. Um, so maybe more similar to some of the other fours we see, just barely over that cusp of being a 5. We're also seeing some very interesting activity in the news that's um, coming from Kilauea, that's, that's more around the 0 to 1, and obviously those aren't trivial eruptions just because they're down at this end, um, they're just uh, slower moving, lower volume. So we'll talk about the things that go into this and I'll show a few examples. But the key ingredients are the eruptive mass, the plume height, how high uh, material is ejected into the atmosphere, and then the duration of, of the eruption. So if we were to uh, look at some activity, we could see things like lava flows. Um, you could look at the lava flows from Kilauea that are moving something like hundreds of meters per day right now. Um, we could also see plenty of lava flows if we just looked here near here. This is a, an aerial photograph of the, the Parkland flow that's about 7,000 years old. And this is just at the margin of another lava flow in the Oregon Cascades. And so these basaltic flows tend to be at the lower end of this volcanic explosivity index um, just because they're not um, erupting mass very high and they're usually relatively low volume eruptions. Is that linear? Yeah. Um, I, it's based on more than one property, so calling it linear or nonlinear is a little tricky, but safely nonlinear. Um, it's not like, say, looking at seismic energy where I can tell you a specific logarithm. Um, but, but yes, uh, an 8 is much more than 8 times more dangerous than a 1. Um, if that makes sense. Even once we get just into the BEI 2 range, these are substantial eruptions that pose a lot of hazards to people. So this is um, from, from Mount Cinnabon in um, the Sumatra subduction zone. This is these images are from 2014. It's still active. Um, had similar eruptions last year in 2017. Uh, many eruptions have characteristics of both explosive phases. So you can see volcanic ash going very high, some denser pyroclastic material sort of flooding down the side of the mountain. Um, you can also see an effusive phase in this night image. You see um, a, a much less viscous lava flow um, flowing down the, the flanks of the mountain. And then here, this is ash fall in the village. It's about 40 kilometers away. So this is still at the BEI 2 end. So there's uh, quite a ways to go as we move up to something like a Mount St. Helens eruption. We'll talk about Mount St. Helens more, but we can sort of put this in the middle of the scale, where if we were to look at the, the sort of plume height um, injected gash, gas and ash um, more than 20 kilometers into the atmosphere, um, and it erupted about a third of a cubic kilometer of ejected mass. Much of that was blasted into really fine particulate matter that was spread over large distances. Um, more of a curious photograph of, of ash falling in Chehalis, um, Washington. Um, recently ran into a petrologist who was so excited about Mount St. Helens blowing up at the time that he was a student that he just took off driving toward it to get as close as he could to learn as much as possible about it and it didn't make it very far before he ruined his car engine because it took so much energy um, and sort of stopped up the side of the road. But um, many unusual stories of how widespread that, that activity, um, that impact of the 1980 eruption was. We'll, we'll look at that more later. Um, but just to put it in context, if we jumped all the way up to the high end, 
we could compare asphalt from Mount St. Helens in 1980 and this little swath here in this map from USGS and compare it to say BEI 7 to 8 eruptions from Long Valley, so on the eastern edge of the Sierra Nevada, uh, Long Valley Caldera, and then uh, an eruption from Yellowstone 2 million years ago in red. So those are the ash beds that we still find geologically. You can go out and point to those. So these are not trace elements that would have fallen at the time of the eruption, um, but they're creating things like this. So there's 10 to 20 centimeters of ash um, in Kansas from um, this 2 million year old Yellowstone eruption. So these would be um, tremendous events that, that would affect um, a large fraction of North America. And if we looked at a simulation from USGS for what the modern ash fall would look like from a, a 300 cubic kilometer uh, dense rock equivalent eruption, this is very similar to the most recent Yellowstone eruption, which was 640,000 years ago, or um, geologists would write this as 0.64 mega annum, or um, millions of years. And you can see that you have something like 30 to 100 millimeters of ash extending about um, almost a thousand kilometers away in some directions, and that you have trace amounts um, on the order of one millimeter extending across the whole country. So that, that those very fine amounts were missing in the past, and we're just seeing the thicker parts of the isopack when, when we look at maps like this. Um, so those VEI 8 ones, 7 and 8, would be um, huge events with respect to um, our ability to go about our, our normal lives. Um, so how often do these things occur is where I was trying to go with this. So if we looked at this in terms of a geologic record, if we could look at the number of reported eruptions. This is um, from a study um, compiled by um, Jeline et al. Um, who's also, um, she is an, an Oregon alumna. Um, we put Mount St. Helens at a VEI 5 on the scale. We can see that there's something like dozens of VEI 5 eruptions in the last 10,000 years. We put the biggest eruption we've seen recently, Mount Pinatubo in here at a VEI 6. We can see that there's maybe more on the order of, of just um, 10 or 20 of those in, in the Holocene record. What's curious about this shape, hopefully from here down, it makes some sense and is a little bit comforting that these really catastrophic eruptions are much less frequent. Um, there are very few of those in the last 10,000 years. What's going on back here is really incomplete reporting. Uh, we're relying on the geologic record here, so a very little eruption may not have a, a noticeable record that someone's been able to compile. But once we go from the VEI 2s and up, this is probably a pretty complete collection. And so then we could use this whole collection and say, how often do these things happen on average? And so if we went with the then BEI here, and this is truncated, so five, right about where uh, Mount St. Helens 1980 is, is at the bottom. That's something like a once every seven to 10 years event. Um, so this is not that unusual. It's, it's certainly the most um, striking, the most impactful event, the best measured event that we've seen in the US um, in, in recent times, but it's something that we can expect to happen in other places around the world. Even if we went up to Mount Pinatubo here, this is something that we might see a VEI 6 eruption every few decades, maybe every three to five decades. Um, so these big eruptions like Mount St. Helens are not necessarily just a, a historical curiosity, they're things that are, are likely to, uh, to happen again, not necessarily in, in the same place. So that's how often they occur. What makes eruptions explosive is an interesting question. Um, and the, the champagne bottle analogy works pretty well. Right? That uh, what makes eruptions explosive is mostly their volatile content, the gases that are held in solution under pressure. And once that solution is depressurized, those gas bubbles are trying to get out. Um, so you need a couple things. You need a whole bunch of gas held in solution under pressure, and you need a strong lid. So the champagne bottle has both of those things. We have the lid nicely anchored on here, and we have plenty of bubbles that were um, held in solution um, inside that champagne. And if we were to look at that in magmas, we see plenty of evidence of um, gas trying to escape. So this is a basalt. We call it a vesicular basalt. So sort of see that it has the casts of all of those bubbles in it. 
gas was trying to escape that magma as it was crystallizing. If you've ever encountered pumice, you can look up close at it and you can see that it also has a bunch of quartz. Um, but it has a, a high porosity or it's a very low density rock because it's filled with um, considerable room for those, those gas bubbles that were there as it was crystallizing. So how does this kind of come up in, in geologic context? Um, we're going to focus on uh, Mount St. Helens, which is a subduction zone volcano. And what's generally going on in a subduction zone is that um, we have an oceanic plate. In our case, we call it the Juan de Fuca plate, but part of the northeastern Pacific seafloor is subducting beneath the edge of North America. And as it does so, it brings down a bunch of things that really belong at the surface. There are things like sediments, there are things like minerals that can carry a lot of volatile content, things like water or other volatiles. And they, are, um, they will go unstable at some depth. And as they go unstable and those fluids rise off of the slab, they'll reduce the melting point of the mantle and drive volcanic activity. One thing that's interesting to keep in mind about this is that Subduction zones are creating volcanic activity, but these are not hot places on Earth. These are actually cold, wet places on Earth, is how we should think of them. Is that this cold seafloor is starting at the bottom of the ocean at about zero degrees C. It's being subducted and dragged in material where a bunch of its minerals are unstable and will release this water. And that water will decrease the, the melting point of the mantle above it. Um, so it's not that uh, places like Mount St. Helens are necessarily unusually hot, it's that the chemistry is unusual and it's depressing the melting point. Um, so if we thought about that in this sort of cross-section schematic here that's a little more realistic, we'd see that there's a cold slab that's sort of keeping the whole, we call it the forearc region, or the area in front of the volcanic arc. It keeps all of this cold, and then there's a rapid transition to melting, bringing heat all the way up to the surface. Um, so why the, the viscosity matters in this? So if we have the gas content from the subduction zone bringing down volatiles, the viscosity is fairly simple to think about. If you were to say, boil a pot of water, that's no problem. It's very easy for the bubbles to get out. They come up from the bottom of the pot, and they're released. Maybe there's a little splashing, but nothing too severe. You can do that all the time. If you start doing that with, say, a thick stew or some marinara, um, it's going to add a few more ornaments to the kitchen or the microwave or what have you because the viscosity has <laughs> gone up, right? So it's very hard for that bubble to now get out without launch. It builds up enough um, pressure to launch a bit of the, the matrix around it, the, the marinara or the uh, molten rhyolite or whatever it might be. Uh, so in volcanoes, they're just kind of taking this to the extreme and building up enough pressure to launch rocks into the sky. Um, but it's, it's largely by increasing the viscosity of, of those melts. Um, and if we were to think about the viscosity of different types of melt, part of the reason we see those VEI 0 and 1 eruptions those are from basalts, which are very low viscosity. They have higher melting temperatures and lower silica content, and that makes them inherently lower viscosity. You're sort of running your liquids that, that flow more easily, whereas things like the day sites that were erupted at Mount St. Helens are much higher viscosity. So they're, they're more like the, the marinara if you want. Um, so, to say all that means that subduction zones, because subduction zones are where silica-rich rocks like dacite are created, and they have the gas content from the subducting slab, they have both of the key ingredients to make um, explosive volcanic eruptions. Um, so any subduction zone, not just the area around Mount St. Helens, would be uh, perfectly adequate to, uh, to make these kinds of explosive eruptions. Viscosity just means resistance to flow. Um, and it's something that can vary a lot. So when we look at viscosity in materials, it can vary by many orders of magnitude. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be thinking about silicate melts, like say, lava flows that are extremely viscous, very thick. You couldn't stir those easily. Yeah, 
So all of this intro is to give a little bit of a, a global perspective and say that um, while Mount St. Helens is perhaps near and dear in the, the local context, it's not unusual. It has many um, counterparts around the world, and they're likely to explosively erupt in the coming years and decades. So Mount St. Helens is sort of an opportunity to look at um, a system where we can observe it up close and see how it's evolved through eruption cycles. And that's a lot of the reason that we would look at this system. And just to point out, um, can we do anything other than be in awe of these kinds of processes? Uh, I'm not here to specifically look at how we should respond in a hazard sense, um, but certainly yes. If we were to look at, a, a, say, a VEI-4 eruption of Mount Pele in Martinique, 29,000 fatalities. There are plenty of signs that this was a problem beforehand, but not enough organization and certainly deficiencies in monitoring compared to today, but organization and uh, the right political will have gone a long way there. So in terms of things like planning, monitoring, and communication, there's a lot we can do. And it all has to be informed by understanding the fundamental processes. So like I said, I'm not going to focus on um, hazards mitigation here. Uh, we're, we're looking more at the fundamental processes beneath Mount St. Helens. But just to point out, if you are interested in, in learning more about um, how the volcanoes are monitored in your region, the USGS has a, a volcano hazards program that includes the Cascade Volcano Observatory based in Vancouver, Washington, and tasked with monitoring the Cascade volcanoes. They're a great source of information. The Pacific Northwest Seismic Network is um, one branch of that monitoring. Part of that network is based at University of Oregon. Part is based at University of Washington. It's run in collaboration um, between the universities and the USGS. Um, if you want to look at it, you know, their websites are great starting resources. Um, this is the website for the, the Cascade Volcano Observatory, great place to look. They're always giving updates about what's going on at any of the volcanoes in the Cascades. Often they're um, just sitting still and looking nice in the landscape, but occasionally there's more interesting activity. Um, even surprising to me, I just looked this up yesterday to have a, a screen draft of this. This is the, the PNSN website. It's on the sub page on Mount St. Helens. And all of these little red dots are earthquakes in the last 24 hours from when I looked at it. So this is continually being updated. These are, uh, we, we could call them micro earthquakes. They're less than magnitude one. They're not um, highly unusual. This is maybe an above average day at Mount St. Helens, but not a, a source of, of concern. But you can get an idea of how these things vary through time and if there are. Um, any real changes in status for these systems. Um, so lots of interesting places to uh, look for information on under regional volcanoes. So Mount St. Helens, to get back to there, we, we know about the, the 1980 eruption, um, but what has Mount St. Helens been doing since then? Uh, I'll just give a, a really brief summary before we start looking at the subsurface imaging that um, I've been doing in collaboration with, with other researchers the past few years. After Mount St. Helens, um, 1980 eruption. Uh, this is a photo from 1982, uh, but the, the process you're seeing here, the growth of this dome inside the crater and this little eruption, this eruption is mostly steam. That continued for about six years, until so about 1986, these steam eruptions were pretty common, and that dome um, was growing in the summit crater. We would be standing basically near Johnston Ridge Observatory, which is on the north side. So this breach is where um, the mountain blew out um, in May 1980. So we're looking south into this sort of horseshoe-shaped crater. Um, and those eruptions continued for about six years. Then there was a hiatus in um, new material coming out of the ground at Mount St. Helens uh, until the most recent eruptive phase, which was 2004 to 2008. And there was a second or sort of new lobe of the dome in the crater that was extruded. This is one example of a day site sort of <coughs> shaped object that was coming up pretty rapidly um, in 2005. Helicopter here for a sense of scale. This again is mostly steam coming out of the rocks. It's quite warm and there is a lot of snow in this crater. It's actually grown a glacier since the eruption in 1980. And so there's plenty of water from that snow and rain that circulates down into the rock and a lot of that comes back up as steam. 
Um, if we wanted a more sort of compelling visual view, this is zooming in a little bit, and you'll see this fin sort of growing back here. This is the new growth of that dome um, in 2005 is kind of when it was growing most rapidly. Um, so these are going through, uh, going through the year and showing you different stages of this dome growth. So very rapid, you're looking at magma that had already crystallized before it got to the surface, and there was enough pressure beneath this plug of rock in order to force it out of the ground. And at the time it was happening, uh, millions of tiny earthquakes were happening around the edges of that plug as it ground its way up to the surface. Uh, a view that uh, kind of offers a, a more holistic perspective on the crater in, uh, in a digital elevation model is here. So this starts in 2005. And there are a couple things happening. You see these bulges coming up. That was the dome we saw in the last video. But you also see, it'll uh, restart again in just a second, you also see that there's sort of material flowing away, sort of flowing around both sides of this horseshoe um, <coughs> away from the dome. And that's actually growth of the glacier in the, the crater at Mount St. Helens. It's so heavily shaded that it stays nice and cold and maintains snow through the year. So it's formed a, probably the only new glacier being formed in the Pacific Northwest in the uh, past few decades. So that's largely uh, what it's been up to. And um, where I'll, I'll go next is really where uh, I start to come into the story, but really with, along with a lot more people. So um, imaging magma under Mount St. Helens, or IMUSH, um, which is not something that I came up with, um, <laughs> is a, a large collaborative project between a number of universities, University of Washington, Rice University, Cornell, USGS, uh, these are all seismic investigators that I've been working with from the University of New Mexico. And then we brought in a service company really from the oil and gas industry is uh, my component of the uh, seismic array. And so it's a map with a tremendous amount of symbols on it. And uh, Mount St. Helens right there in the middle. You can kind of maybe just barely make out the horseshoe crater. But right in the middle is Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams over here, Mount Rainier. And uh, there were many components to this seismic research project. The uh, yellow triangles, yellow-orange triangles recorded for about two years. They're broadband seismometers. They're good at recording really low frequencies as well as really high frequencies. Um, kind of do-it-all instrument. Those sat there for two years um, for, for structure and earthquake studies. And then there are a lot more dots. These, uh, well, I guess we'll start with the black ones. The black ones were only recording for about 24 hours total. And they were recording explosions that were set off at these blue triangles. So these were shallow explosions in wells, 1,000 or 2,000 pounds of explosive, in a, a well that was about uh, 10 to 20 meters deep. So these do not blow out to the surface. They're contained beneath it. And um, altogether unimpressive if you're right there, and as they're intended to be. Uh, but there are clear plan signals that you can record from far away. Uh, and so those were set up, and then all the black dots were moved to become the red dots, and then the light blue triangles were set off as, as further explosive charges or controlled sources for seismology. My part, and the purple ones in the middle, and uh, believe me, I'll zoom in and, and sort of focus closer to the mountain for the rest of this, um, but those recorded both rounds of shots as well as recording continuously for about two weeks. Uh, so what we could break, how we could break the seismic experiment up is the active part, the passive part, and then my sort of hybrid um, add-on to uh, uh, an experiment that was already planned. And we added about 900 instruments. They're, they're vertical components. We call them geophones, but they're really um, your sort of simplest seismometer, they're just a mass on a spring moving up and down. Uh, that, that mass on the spring is um, moving, over, uh, moving over a magnet, and so it's the velocity of that mass moving generates a current proportional to um, the, the speed that is moving up and down. Uh, it's a very simple instrument. What was unusual is these are normally used for active source experiments. We recorded continuously for two weeks with um, just shy of a thousand of them, all within about a 12 kilometer radius of Mount St. Helens. Uh, 
and so I'll uh, focus more on that part. Just want to mention uh, briefly where that research started off because it's kind of a different reporting strategy than people have been using uh, for most seismic experiments lately. And uh, I was first drawn to trying this by actually working with oil and gas industry data from Long Beach, California. And what was striking to me as a seismologist normally concerned more with scientific topics like tectonics and magnetism that if we looked at a sort of world-class seismic observatory, Southern California Seismic Network, right? It's kind of important to monitor earthquake activity near the greater Los Angeles area. That's the black triangles. That gray mass there is actually 5,000 independent dots. That's an oil and gas industry array, which uh, to a seismologist looks gorgeous, right? The earth is almost carpeted with seismometers in Long Beach here. So they're along the airport runway, that's that line, the busiest port in the country, the busiest interstate in the country, two million people live inside the array. Um, what you can do with that is, is, is very impressive. They, in this case, they were driving up and down the roads with fiber size trucks. And most of the continuous data, they were not interested in at all. Uh, that was where I came in as a postdoc and I did research with those data, but that's uh, neither here nor there for this talk because there's no volcano there. Um, but, you know, why is this in here? The Long Beach Anacline is this hill, or this hill is actually called Signal Hill. Um, and it has an apparently proud history of oil and gas production. Um, it's a little less conspicuous today. Um, the, the derricks have changed to uh, much less imposing features, but there are still pump jacks on elementary school playgrounds and behind McDonald's. And on anybody's land, there are thousands of active wells in, in Long Beach. And they're still trying to understand the subsurface. That's one of the things that's impressive to me from a scientific perspective. They've been producing oil and gas here since uh, the late 20s. There are thousands of holes in the ground that they have direct samples from. And they're still trying to understand the 3D structure in enough detail to get the most out of that reservoir. Um, so then if we think about a place like Mount St. Helens, where we've had about 10 seismometers since 1980. <laughs> How much do we know about the subsurface in comparison? Um, so it's kind of um, striking. It shows you how far you have to go or how hard it is to really understand everything that's going on beneath the subsurface if they're just still trying to understand the system. And people look at it as the classic, simplest oil and gas trap. The top of this canopline are these folded rocks would guide all the oil and gas right up to where you park the wells and it moves toward you, you're in great shape. Um, people uh, looked at this as sort of the, the classic oil and gas trap. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's tough to really know what's going on down there. But it helps if you have lots of seismometers. So um, just look at one example of data for this before moving back to Mount St. Helens. On the left is a snapshot. But on the right, you're about to see a wave field go across this, an earthquake wave field go across this array. You start to see the ripples moving across. These would be the P waves, the larger amplitude S waves. This is a magnitude three earthquake that happened only, it would have happened right about here for scale and then propagated across the array. Um, so you can think of this as we'd say, it's like dropping a pebble in the pond, right? You get this one, one or two simple waves that would propagate across the array and that'd be all there is to see. Obviously there's a lot more information than that if you're to look even in this slow frame snapshot, you can see that basically across the city block in Long Beach, you go from upward motion to downward motion first. That is not something we'd predict if we didn't know about the structure here. That's actually guided by the recording we were faulted on. Um, so quite, uh, quite a rich set of information um, in these seismograms. Here, um, I should have mentioned at the beginning, they're just plotted, seismograms are plotted, it's just red is upward motion, blue is downward motion. So they just wiggle back and forth. Um, normally, the Southern California Seismic Network would have one station in this area. So you thought about how much information you could extract from this versus just one wiggly line. It's quite a change. It's polished on one side, and it's not polished on the other. You'll see that one. But this is the source of pretty much all our volcanic activity on Earth. You start melting the mantle, and if the mantle melts, the first thing it produces is basalt. At Hawaii, that would erupt directly to the surface. At a subduction zone volcano, it gets sort of processed into dacite, 
which is what erupted at, erupted at Mount St. Helens. There are things other than daysite that could erupt, um, but we'll just take Mount St. Helens as an example. And it, it erupted daysite primarily in 1980 and 2004 and 2008. This fourth character here, serpentinite, is what would happen to a prototype if you added a bunch of water to it and it was cold. So that will be our kind of unusual character in the story. So to give an idea of what I mean for the parts of subduction zone structure we want to image, I'll show a few other things. This map on the left is measured heat flow. Um, the, the units are things like milliwatts per meter squared. So how much energy is coming out of the ground per square meter. If you had a room about this size, you could probably power about a 50 watt light bulb continuously with just the, the energy coming out of Earth's surface from the back in this room. In volcanic areas, it can be higher, but it varies on Earth's surface. If you look at the coast of Oregon and Washington, and this is not because of the ocean, the coastal area is very low heat flow. It would be down around 30 or 40 milliwatts per meter squared, whereas you could get over 100 milliwatts per meter squared out here in, say, the, the high lava plains area of southeast Oregon, many areas over 100 milliwatts per meter squared in the volcanic arc. Certainly, if we were measuring near Mount St. Helens or Mount Adams, it's, it's quite high. So what subduction zones do is they put very cold things right next to very hot things. And what I mean by that, I'll show in a second, but that cold slab sinking into the, the mantle is keeping the, the forearm, the coast cold, and then it inserts all of these hydrous minerals that melt the mantle. And as that melt descends to the surface, it heats up this area. We could look at that in a, in a thermal model here, where it would show the cold stuff sinking back into the mantle, and it cools down this area where it keeps sinking. Mount St. Helens is actually kind of unusual in that it's positioned farther west, or closer to this low heat flow area than any other major volcano in the Cascades. Um, so in some ways, we wonder, what's it doing there? Is it in an area that's so cold it couldn't even operate like a normal volcanic system? And so to give an idea of why this is cold, you should just think of this as an ice-cold conveyor belt sinking into the mantle. So you're always insulating the bottom of the coastal part of Oregon and Washington with a plate that's been on the bottom of the ocean, so it's near zero degrees C. So one of the things we did is we went hunting for this transition. You see this sort of vertical wall here in these thermal models. These are predicted models of subduction zones from just heat transport. And so we went sort of hunting for that vertical wall, and where is it with respect to Mount St. Helens? How far is it into the cold part of the subduction zone? We hunted for it with reflected waves from the crust mantle boundary. So you can think of it as our seismic source. It's not a hammer in this case, it's an explosion. And some of that energy would go down and hit its interface, like the boundary between the crust above and the mantle below, and it would reflect back up. And so what we've done is stack all the seismograms, average all the seismograms from our array to hunt for those reflections up here. So for these three explosions, here are these averages of the seismograms. They show us this peak that's reflected energy about 40 kilometers deep. That's where we think the cross male boundary is, is exactly as we expect. So it's these three on the east side of Mount St. Helens. If we switch over to the west side of Mount St. Helens, we take the average again of thousands of seismograms from this big explosion, and we see precisely nothing. The crust mantle boundary has disappeared. And the way that it could disappear is that sort of slippery, soapy textured rock. That's the serpentite. Uh, there are different forms of serpentite, but we'll, we'll simplify here. Uh, if we were to look at the one that, that might be present down there, we call it antigorite. And we could think about the, the boundary where antigorite becomes unstable. So where would it be too hot for that to exist? If you heat up that soapy rock too much, the water would come out of it, and it would help fuel things like our volcanism, things like Mount St. Helens. And so where we see this reflective boundary disappear, this is a cross-section through Mount St. Helens, which would be the deep earthquakes. This boundary tells us sort of a temperature. It's a way to map out the temperature in the subsurface. It's where you go from having the antigorite, that soapy rock over here, to having the peridotite, the nice green-looking one that's polished on one side and not polished on the other side, over here. 
So it appears that St. Helens is actually positioned in one of these thermal models right at this boundary, uh, where it goes from very cold mantle any farther west of St. Helens that transitions right beneath it. So it appears that the melts from St. Helens would probably have to come up from the east side, from the hotter part of the mantle, where it could take some of that hydrated material and then inject basalt into the lower crust. Um, so that's one more piece of this story is that Mount St. Helens at the base of the crust is at this big transition between the cold part of the subduction zone and the hot part of the subduction zone. Um, so melts probably come up from the east side a little more toward Mount Adams. The third one is uh, the third piece of this sort of structural story is to look at what we call seismic tomography. Um, I didn't think I'd have enough time to do more of a tutorial here, but we look at how quickly the seismic waves propagate based on their arrival times. So if a wave arrives later than you expect it to, it must have gone through something slow. If it arrives early, it must have gone through something fast. And so this is a, a cross-section view cutting through Mount St. Helens using those active sources again. And this is work from, from Eric Kaiser, now an assistant professor at the University of Arizona. Um, and what he's showing is how fast the two waves travel at different parts of the subsurface. So generally, wave speeds are slower near the surface. Things are less compacted, lower density, so they don't propagate waves as quickly. And velocity increases downward. But it doesn't do so uniformly everywhere. Um, so at Mount St. Helens, we see a couple of things. The very lowest velocities, presumably the hottest areas that might have melted them in the deep crust, are offset to the east of Mount St. Helens, much as we would have predicted based on the reflection imaging that said the hot parts to the east, the cold parts to the west. The other part that's sort of simplified here is uh, this F1, that sort of round patch, is very high, we would say, P velocity relative to S velocity. Um, P waves are compressional ones, sort of squishing and stretching something. Shear waves, sort of, uh, change the shape, but not the volume of things. Um, so different um, types of materials will have different P and S velocities. Um, one way you could think of this, if you took, say, a deck of cards, it'd be very easy to deform it in shear, right? You could spread it out on the table, but you can't compress it very easily. You know, it's very tough in that direction. Um, when you add a little bit of melt to rocks, they get very weak in shear, but they're still pretty strong in compression. Uh, so we think this is the main magma reservoir in the upper crust is, is up here. Um, so the parts, if we were to look at this and, and sort of put it together, we have this wall down here in the mantle where we have a cold serpentinite where the water is bound in this rock that's altered the peridotite. Over here we have peridotite where the water has been uh, liberated from the slab and it's melted the peridotite. When peridotite melts, you get that black rock that's being passed around. It's one that has a fair amount of um, bubbles in it, pore space in it. Um, that basalt would be the, the direct product of melting the peridotite. But it's not what dominantly comes out the top of Mount St. Helens. It would get processed into day site here. The day site would rise upward, possibly making the deep long period earthquakes on its way accumulate in this shallower magma reservoir from about 5 to 12 kilometers depth beneath Mount St. Helens. And when it accumulates enough so that there's enough buoyancy, enough pressure, that it can make its way to the surface, then you'd have an eruption at Mount St. Helens. So we kind of see the, the four pieces of the story, the sort of normal mantle that um, when melted could produce the basalt, the cold mantle west of Mount St. Helens that would be in this sort of wavy colored region out here, and then these two magma reservoirs beneath the surface. So this is sort of a sense for how seismology would map out these different parts of the um, Mount St. Helens magmatic system. And I, I essentially aim to uh, end there so that we have a little time to get questions from you guys, but I'd just like to thank all the field workers who were involved, uh, National Science Foundation who supported the work, and one nice aspect that all the field workers there, most of them were um, 
Also, seismology students at University of New Mexico. So they helped collect the data, and then in the fall, we started using the data in seismology class at UNM in Albuquerque. And so many of them got to help analyze some of those data, and even some of the things that I brought up in the talk were things we first found in um, class lab exercises. So, um, a very fun and uh, helpful experiment for getting seismology going at the University of New Mexico. And um, hopefully there's some curiosity. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks. Yeah, so the question is, if after two weeks we went back out and picked up our sensors, yes, we have to go physically pick them up and download the data from them. Um, the facility they have for doing this will look um, strangely like perhaps a, a wine cellar. It's a rack with a bunch of boxes, right? You dump in these cylindrical seismometers and it sucks off all the data, recharges the instrument, and then um, I get a big hard drive in the mail a couple weeks later. So, what is this? This one is actually from Hawaii, but it's a piece of basalt. Um, so if it has enough gas in it, it'll be flakier. And it's flaky just because you have all these thin pieces surrounding bubbles or surrounding cavities in the rock. Um, I flew here from New Mexico and did not bring rocks, so I was kind enough to get these from the uh, professor. I uh, was kind enough to lend me things from his collections so that you could have a physical sense of the uh, rock characters in the story. But this one is, is not strictly from St. Helens. If the salt cooled under more pressure, it wouldn't have these bubbles in it. Because the salt I see in my head is just pure cold. Sure, you can see things like kilometer basalt that have uh, very little bubbles in them. Those columns form because they're they're cooled beneath the surface a little more slowly. But yeah, it's often very solid rock. Uh, but you know, I'm only so strong, and I carried all these around. And so I took the, the easy one, the particular one. Yeah, sometimes it has uh, more more pore space, and sometimes almost none. Where was Harry Truman's cabin in that picture? Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell where Spirit Lake is. Yeah, so Spirit Lake would be off to your left in this picture, and what's called the Truman Trail starts about here and continues up off the image to the left. It kind of, yeah. Um, but I, I don't know along that trail exactly where the cabin was located. Uh, I just know it could have been about a couple kilometers on that trail. Uh, but it'd be off to the left, and that's where Spirit Lake is. Thank you. All, all the way in the back. Thank you. Yep. So you mentioned, or explained why Mount St. Helens is slightly off the line of, of the others in, in terms of, but, but does that just sort of imply that with subduction, there are various things that control where you get that critical point um, where this kind of activity can form? and and all the others happen to be in a line, and this is a place where it goes a little bit uh, westward? Yeah, so what you know, what controls this, this vertical line? And this is not something that has to be fixed through time. You can slightly change the rate at which the plate is subducting, or variations in the thickness of the crust on the plate might vary its, its dip angle, um, variations in the sort of 3D shape of the slab. This is probably something that evolves with time. Mm -hmm. And if we were to look at a volcanic center like Mount St. Helens, Mount St. Helens has been about where it is doing about what it's been doing for about 300,000 years. The Cascade Arc has been around for about 40 million years. So when we think of these volcanoes over the long term of, say, the history of the subduction zone, they're not fixed. The volcanoes don't always have to be where they are today. They're kind of dancing around in this line at about that distance from it. The trench and, and they'll move a little closer or a little farther through time. We can see that many of the older volcanoes, the often called the Western Cascades, are actually farther west of, say, the modern um, volcanic arc position today. So we see a lot of volcanic rocks. In, say, if you start driving from here and you go toward the Cascades, you'll see volcanic rocks before you get to the volcanoes. Uh, if you went back in time, 
some of those volcanoes were uh, aligned a bit closer to the arc, than, or sorry, a bit closer to the coast than uh, they are today. So yeah, that, that moves through time and it's a, a delicate balance of temperature and melting and water in the subduction zone. So as the coast builds up, that moves them further, um, further east? I could, uh, you know, make wagers on where it would go, but I wouldn't actually <laughs> know. Um, so it, 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 it's a matter of how hot it is right here. So maybe um, based on, on the rate of subduction, you could you could move this a little bit. Say you're feeding that conveyor belt down faster, that would change the thermal structure a little bit. Um, but exactly how it's balanced is, is pretty hard to tell. Um, through long terms, we can see some movements in the position of chains of volcanoes, like I mentioned the, the Western Cascades or the mm -hmm. uh, older part of the Cascades were a little farther west in Oregon. What's the, um, the difference between the Western Cascades and the chemical composition of the daysite and the, the salt, since it's kind of variable? So I'm primarily in geophysics, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, the main thing is really seeing the silica content change. So sort of rocks will have a bunch of, will have other metals in them, uh, a lot of magnesium and aluminum in the mantle. Um, the aluminum still, or sorry, magnesium and iron in the mantle. Um, aluminum silicate rocks are more common in the crust. Um, so if we were to look at something like um, what uh, the lighter colored rock I was passing around is, is actually a rhyolite, but what I could um, find this afternoon um, on arriving, uh, that's probably something like upwards of 60 or 65 percent SiO2 silica, whereas the, the band is a bit lower. It has more magnesium and iron in it, but it's still a silicate rock. So what we're seeing on that transition from melting the mantle is uh, a trend toward increasingly silica rich composition. Yep, all the way back there. We know about some of the anecdotal storytelling uh, eruptions of various volcanoes. When was, do we think, the last eruption for Adams was? We don't know when the last eruption for Adams was offhand. Um, certainly a, a, a large edifice that's been built up. Um, I'd, I'd have to take a look, I would guess, in the tens of thousands of years, maybe for a really big eruption, but I, I really don't know offhand the last major eruption from from Mount Adam. Uh, yep. So the accumulation of the back pipe, so would that be a predictor if you could look under various volcanoes? Would that be a predictor of its potential for eruption? Yeah, so getting into interesting and, and, and sort of touchy territory, but um, you know, how we could look at something like this through time and say, is it changing? Um, one of the ways you could do that is to look at um, what we call geodesy, or changing shape of the, the surface of Earth. And so satellite data are very good there, GPS or other types of, of radar data. You could tell us if, say, Earth is moving up or down or to the side. And so when we see a bulge beneath the surface, it'll move the surface up, and then at the planks of that bulge, it'll move it outward, away. And so at some volcanoes, you can see inflation events that, that will occur. Um, it's, there's, there's still a bit of business involved in inferring what depth and what shape is inflating in the subsurface, but that's something we can put bounds on. So it's part of the reason people monitor St. Helens, there are GPS monuments on the flanks of Mount St. Helens that would show it's continuously moving up in time as if something were inflating beneath it. And that's something that people keep track of. In uh, more of a modern seismology perspective, people also try and do um, repeat measurements using um, continuously propagating seismic noise to see if the subsurface, excuse me, if the subsurface structure is changing. Most of the time, we see that in the very near surface because of hydrologic variations, changes in the amount of water in the very shallow subsurface. But if there were large changes at depth, that, that may be a target that's more accessible in the future, too. Um, so, so we can try and track if this thing's changing through time, but it's, um, it's always a, a, a little bit of inference involved and in, say, 
modeling, what are the different circumstances that could produce deformation measured at the surface. It's not, uh, it's not correct. Good time for one more. Yeah. Does the presence of water and other sediments in the uh, cold oceanic slab, wouldn't it lower the viscosity of the rocks, or is that solely based on the amount of silica? So what would the, the sediments do in this system? Um, the sediments themselves um, can melt. We definitely see geochemical um, commonalities between the sediments that go down trenches and the, the chemistry of the rocks that come up at volcanoes um, when they lower the viscosity. So the, the sediments usually are more silica-rich rocks. They're eroded off the edge of the continent, dumped on the continental shelf, and dragged back down. Um, there's some give and take there. Um, they carry water with it, um, which will reduce the melting points. And molten rock is always going to be a lot less viscous than um, solid rock. Um, solid rock at high temperature is a little bit gooey, um, but it's much thicker than the melt. So the dominant thing is that the water dragged down with those sediments reduces the melting point. Um, they're also contributing silica-rich compositions that can help make some of the silica-rich rocks that do come out at, at continental um, arc volcanoes. All right. Well, I, I have an answer to the Mount Adams. Okay. Question. It, there's an infographic in the other room that shows how recently all of the um, volcanoes have erupted, and Mount Adams has been in the last 1,000 and 3,000 years. I should have stopped by there. <laughs> <laughs>